everybody out there in uh, TV land and here. Let's have a word of prayer. We need to pray for, uh, I'm going to ask Sister Mary and if she opened in prayer. We need to pray for Mark. We need to pray for Fidel. We need to pray for John. And there are the three that were, oh, and then uh, Kim and her family. Yeah, and Carolina. Yeah. Carolina. Oh, yeah. You want me to do it for you? Yeah. Okay. God, thank you for this time to get together and to uh, study your word. But uh, just as important, it's a time to petition you for favor and for blessing. And so we bring the names of Mark Stevenson and Fidel Alona. <coughs> John Villa Nuevo and Carmelina and Kim and Pastor as they're all uh, dealing with their own issues that, uh, whether it be sickness or death or whatever it be in their life we claim victory over that that you've defeated the enemy and there's no reason for them to suffer mentally or physically from any, uh, any situation they're going through, Lord. But they can just praise you for what you've already done and receive your healing. And we just give you the praise for what you do in our lives. And the miracles are endless if we just listen to your voice and uh, look for what you do in our daily life. Thank you for Jim that's willing to step up and teach. And uh, we look forward to tonight's lesson that will encourage us and uh, teach us how to be more effective for witness for you as we run into people on the street or in the store or wherever that we can share the love of you've shown to us with them and encourage them in their lives. We just give you all the praise in the name. Amen. Not what that is, that's not what I want. <laughs> All right, so this is a Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're continuing on with the foundations. The uh, last four weeks, We've been uh, learning about the Bible, its origins, and its uh, reliability. And so from beginning to night, we're going to talk about God. And this would be a four-part uh, lesson also. So it's going to, pretty much every aspect of God that we can think of will be covered. Okay. So these next four weeks, we're going to be a life change objective to gain a deeper sense of God's love for you, for you as, his, as his being our Heavenly Father, and that we would act in some way on the fact that God is our Father. So uh, we're going to look at how God is real. How do we know God exists? God is revealed. God is relational, then the truth about God, the number one way we see that God is relational. So we're, that's going to take four weeks. So how do you see God? As, as children, well, we're not really children in the human sense, but uh, when, when we were children, our individual perception of God may vary, you know. So uh, we sing a song, and some see him as red, others as yellow, others as brown, black, and white. That old song, I don't remember, remember reading 
singing that. Jesus loves all his children, don't you? Red, yellow, or black, and white. They are precious in his sight. So perhaps. Welcome back. Hey, hi. Well, yeah. hi. Come so, in. So how was uh, how was the trip up there? Right. Did you guys get a chance to go into see San Fidel? Uh, no, no, it was just an old Oh man, yeah, I, I got off that one time when I saw it. It's uh, just a little pothole of the village. That's recording him pretty good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brother John. Get him a little chat, though. Bless you, brother. Well, Running. <clears throat> so, there's different ways that we perceive God. Oh, here. Oh, here. And, uh, Thank you. Some of us perceive them like we did our, our parents, either our father or mother. Others may perhaps as a favorite uncle or aunt. And uh, one of your teachers. So I don't know how you perceive God. Or some other significant person in your life. Some of us might even perceive them as the grouch next door. Or the ice cream man. Or how about the cop who gave you a ticket or didn't give you a ticket and just gave you warning instead or the cop we see on TV that shot and killed somebody. So we each have our own perspective. What comes into our minds as we think about God is the most important thing about us. A.W. Tozier, I don't know if you've ever read any of his books or not. He has a lot of good commentaries. I suggest that you read them. So that was going again. Now, our lesson tells us we must also have a humble heart as we study the person of God. Augustine, one of the early church followers, has said, if you can understand it, that is the person of God, it's not true. In other words, we can't really fully comprehend God. So as we look at God's existence, we need to remember three key truths. One, God is real. Two, God is revealed. And three, God is relational. So we're going to look at every aspect of those things about our Lord. God is not a character in a story or in some fairy tale. He is as real as we are. And sometimes we forget that he has this some of the same emotions that we have. I know my Bible says he can be angry. Mm -hmm. We know that he wept mm -hmm. at the tomb of Lazarus. So we know he has emotions and he's ex through Christ he's experienced everything that we need and well Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. He's not fickle. He's not fickle as a Teenager just had the first kiss. For he's uniform by nature. He's very consistent. We can rely on him. Now we'll get a little deeper here in just a second. So how do we know God exists? Well, we see God's creativity. We see what he's created, and we see what he's made. And you can jot down those references that are on the Display if you like Genesis 1 1, Romans 1 20, or Acts 14 16 through 17. The Bible says, now we're talking about we see God through his creativity. And Psalms 19 1 and 2, would someone like to read that for us? Psalm. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament she, she went. Sure. His handiwork, uh, his windy work, day un, un, unto day, un, utter speech, and night unto night, so is the knowledge. Okay, so, sure. the, right. The Bible does not present arguments for God's existence. The Bible assumes that he does. This verse is one quoted by the, that we just read in. What I just read was quoted by one of America's first astronauts in space when he looked out the porthole and he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And I don't remember his name. Uh, 
Some of you might know Avery Willis and who that is or was. The late Avery Willis alluded to the vastness of God's creation known as the universe. And he said, in the great vastness of space, we must tra travel at least 12 billion years at the speed of light before we begin to reach the area of the universe that cannot be seen with telescopes from our planet. That's pretty far, isn't it? And who wants, who knows how much lies behind that, beyond that? Hi. Hi. <laughs> have you guys with us today? Did everybody see the monitor? Yes. Yes. All right. I can move back a little further, or we can move this corner out of the Turn it just a little bit. So we're talking about the existence of God. Uh, in those of you who were in Spanish class last week, you probably heard part of this. Yes. But uh, we're a week behind first. One reason or another. Okay. So uh, again, the late Avery Willis alluded to the vastness of God's creation, known as the universe. The great grasp great passes of space, we must travel at least 12 billion years at the speed of light before we begin to reach the area of the universe that can no longer be seen by a telescope from the Earth. <clears throat> Yet Isaiah, in Isaiah 40, 12 says, God hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and they need it out, and he's measured out heaven with the span of his hand. You know, we measure a, a horse height by the span of your hand. If you say the horse is 15 hands high, it means 15 times this space is how it is. And so he says that God has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and measured out heaven with the span. He measures space by the width of his hand. Now, how big is God's hand? It must be pretty big. Better <laughs> <laughs> straighten up or he'll backhand There you go. Right. Uh, how would you like to have a backhand? We, number two, we see God's thumbprint in human history. So we'd like to read for us Acts, it's right there on the board, 17, verse 26 to 27. Acts 17, that's right. And that's right, down the screen. Okay. Oh, yes. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for the dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Amen. Amen. You know, I like that song that says, reach out and touch the Lord. And you know, we used to sing that a lot in the church I pastored. And, but I like to know that we can just reach out just like the woman who touched the hem of Christ's garment. All we had to do is just read out. And we can feed. Yeah. Um, I've been doing a little research lately on, uh, specifically on this verse, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the firmament show his, shows his handiwork. Day unto day, utter speech and the night shows his knowledge. Um, Many times we think of the zodiac as a demonic thing, but it was taken over uh, by the evil one, by Satan himself, and 
the church gave it up. But in the beginning, if you studied the zodiac, you actually studied the story of God. For instance, there's a if you're born in August, you're under the sign of Virgo, which is virgin. And in the classical images of the virgin, she has um, uh, like a wheat stalk with uh, seed on the top. And it says that Christ is born of a virgin, the seed of a woman. And so as you begin to study more and more of what classical um, astronomy, not astrology, what astronomy was, you begin to see where those that didn't couldn't read, those that didn't have the gospel, could, uh, when it is presented to them, if they knew astronomy, they wouldn't have the story there. Leo is the king, and of course the king of Judah is Jesus, Jesus himself. And when you go into the uh, zodiac, each part of the sky, because there's 12 of them, is one twelfth of a circle, 360 degrees. Within that one twelfth of a circle, for each sign, that's broken into three separate pieces of pie. If you begin to look at some of the stars in there, and what they were named by the Arab and the um, Greek and the Chinese, the stars will actually have biblical names when they're translated into a biblical name, which will tie to a verse where God declares himself in the Bible. So many times in the, in the modern church, we're told, oh, don't have anything to do with the zodiac, don't have anything to do with um, astron astrology, which is true, you don't want to worship that. Right. But the signs are all there. If you, if you take a look at it with fresh eyes from classical astronomy and what perhaps the wise men from the Middle East knew when they saw a comet go through a certain thing, they said, oh, there is a king of the Jews being born because it's a certain comet passing through a part of the zodiac, which they interpreted as being um, a Jewish king, a king of Israel. Now, where would they get that idea? Well, they were, from a standpoint of um, uh, reading the sky and all that stuff, they were descendants of Daniel, not descendants of uh, birthwise of Daniel, but when da Daniel defeated all the other prophets and came out of the lion's den, he had all authority. He had um, people listening to him. And so it would have been easy for uh, his word and his testimony and so forth to be taught down through that whole eastern region to where by the time Christ came, uh, several um, centuries later, that they would have seen this and said, oh, gee, according to astronomy, and of course, not maybe or maybe not realizing it actually came from Daniel, that that means there's a Jewish king being born, and we must go and pay homage to that Jewish king as a part of our heritage. So it's, it's bigger than just just reading one verse and saying right. it's very deep. It's, it's very deep if you start to pick back on it. Why is that there? All that kind of stuff. And it's just amazing how without ever picking up the Bible, God spelled out exactly what was going to happen and the roles that were going to be played in it. And don't let the devil and astrologers and all that stuff dissuade you from looking up in the sky and realizing if this verse is true, God wrote it in the stars. Amen. There's an interesting book that I don't know if you can get it online, but uh, once one summer our junior high camp went through this book and related every night we the teacher related to one or two of the of the signs. And the Aquarius is it, it indicative of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. But so the name of it is that the heavens declare the glory of God. It was written in the 1800s, like 1868 or something like that. But uh, I don't know if you can find a copy. If you do, make sure you get me one. But it's a very good book. And it explains all of that. And it talks about the crucifixion. It talks about the nativity. It talks about the Holy Spirit. 
What's the name? The of heavens it? declare the glory of God. Because I had heard that from uh, who was it? Um, there was a uh, uh, preacher said, named David, um, not Jeremiah. Jack Russ. No, different one. I'll, I'll think of it eventually. But anyway, he has a video on YouTube okay. where he talks about the first two of them, which are the Virgin and Leo. But then he has a series and he goes around the entire zodiac and ties it verse for verse. And then there's other people on YouTube that have taken it further and divided it into that three pieces of pie per zodiac sign and the names of the stars within there. Well, and that, is that the way that the wise men were actually astrologers? I believe, well, yeah. yeah, it says they were, but I believe I believe that's how they knew it was a Jewish right. king because that would have been a part of their uh, teaching right. left over from Daniel okay. and uh, so forth. Anyway, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But, um, Do you know the name of the book? It, it, well, well, I'll look it up on Amazon and tell well, you what. I have, I have one that has to do with stars or the universe itself. Uh, you know, uh, technology nowadays is uh, scientists are, or astronomers are seeing the stars and one of the things that they notice that the universe is expanding. And what the Bible says, uh, God says he spread the heavens, or he spread it. So that kind of lines up to what they're barely finding out right now. Mm -hmm. right. It's been written for a long time. Mm -hmm. Gee, is it amazing how accurate science is becoming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on, we're going to call on Daniel here in just a minute. But number three, we see God's actions in our lives. You know, and the Acts uh, 17, 26, and 27. Mary, could you read that for us, please? And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. Oh, I think he already read this. If that, yeah, you know, Frank did. If that um, they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Yeah, yeah. Frank, Frank read that already. I think it is a misprint. I think it's a misprint. Oh, I see. I've got it on their choice. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> okay, history. It's, it's history. Twice, huh? Yes, it's worth repeating. Okay. His story, <laughs> history, uh, I don't know if you heard the phrase, it's really his story with a capital H. Even while he awaits to finish his story, it's very evident that God is the author and director and main character in this story we call life. He, God, is both the Alpha and the Omega, mm -hmm. the beginning and the end. He controls the whole thing. He, he governs both when good and evil reigns, and then he tells us he does it so that men should seek the Lord and happily they might feel after him or find him. You know, he says, seek me while you should, may, seek me while I shall, may be found. You know, and that's one problem that we have today. We're not really, as a, as a church, as, as the church, because a lot of people are Christians and they're really not seeking after the Lord. They, they have a, uh, a one day experience with the Lord and they think that's all there is to it. But there's more. Uh, as he was guiding the astrologers, the wise men, he'll guide us and he'll direct us. Remember, he says that he has, he knows what his thoughts are for us and he has plans for us. Uh, I don't care. Uh, I, I see, I have one grandson, well, two grandsons that were born illegitimately outside of childbirth, out of marriage. And I can see, especially in the one, I can see how God has had his hand on this kid. He's now almost 30. But I can see the many souls that he brought into the kingdom of God. And despite the fact of the way he was conceived, God still has a plan and a purpose for him. And 
I had one friend that used to say, well, uh, when he used the B word, and we won't use it here, but the, he says, well, he himself being an illegitimate child with someone found something wrong, they said, well, just blame it on me, the illegitimate child. Well, no. Each of us in God's eyes are legitimate. And he has a purpose and he has a plan. And he wants to not only use us, but he wants to allow others to minister to us as well. And uh, for us to benefit from it. You know, so, so Acts chapter 17, I'll report, he, he tells us that he does it so that men should seek the Lord if happy they might feel after him and find him. And, you know, uh, where there's a parable in the Bible about the woman who lost a coin and she called all of her girlfriends in and asked them to help her find the coin. And when they finally found it, they rejoiced. Well, that coin was part, was part of her dowry, is my understanding. And without her dowry being complete, she couldn't get married. So she needed that coin. And uh, you've seen the Mr. T and all the jewelry he wears. Well, it, back in the olden days, back in the New Testament, in the Old Testament times, the women wore their dowry around their neck. They would keep it close to them. It also indicated to any gentleman in the area that they were available. So, but we need to really seek the Lord, just like that lady looked for that coin. And I went frantic the other day, and I was looking for my clicker from the computer, and I couldn't find it. And I was really getting upset with myself. This is last Wednesday. And then I found it. It was the next day it was inside the study book. <laughs> I, I folded the book shut, and it was the clicker was inside the book. One thing, too, this verse says, um, and hath made one blood of all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Okay? So, um, you know, the old saying, if we cut ourselves, what kind of blood do we bleed? Mm -hmm. But when you really, really think about it, we all come from Noah. Now, right. You know, everything before Noah was wiped away. So we can trace, and you think, well, gee, that, you know, big deal to say that. No, stop and think about it. Between Noah and his wife, they had every possible common genetic combination that you see on earth today in DNA. Amen. So Frank and I are twins. We're at least cousins. <laughs> but we all, we, we all come directly from Noah, yeah. maybe 1,400 generations later. But our DNA is from Noah and his wife, and that's all it's from. And it's amazing that in that in their DNA stream, they had all the possible combinations that we see on Earth today, because that's where everything comes from. Yeah. On our Sunday school a, a few weeks ago, yeah. Sister Beatrice mentioned that she had taken a DNA test and she found out she was part Jamaican or something. I and I said, "That's no surprise. Exactly what you said. Yeah. You know." The, the, Stop and think. We're all related after Absolutely. after the flood. You know. Yeah. Okay. That's that's so, kind of why the the term race doesn't mean anything. That was a construct of the eighteen hundreds. There's only one race, the human race. Right. And right. we all come from Noah and his wife. Yeah. And we're all you know. It's just like saying, well, well, if your grandfather and my grandfather were the same person, then we're more closely related. Well, big deal. Just go back 14 other generations, and our grandfather are the same person. Yeah. So our DNA had to be found inside of him. Amen. Uh, and so my oldest daughter, think, yeah, my oldest daughter traced our family tree. She went back 126 generations, and when she got to David, she stopped. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, see, I got you trumped. I'm Noah. <laughs> I have all the way back to Noah. You can only go to David. Yeah. <laughs> well, she stopped there. <laughs> my, and, my, and mine's biblical, see, in the Bible. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you all married too over here? <laughs> no, I mean, you, you stop and think of that. Just that thought solves a lot of arguments in today's world. Right. Yeah. Well, what are you? What are you? 
But we all come from one set of DNA. Amen. Or two if you call it nomad mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. And uh, we, we all come from, so it says, the, um, made of one blood of all nations. Mm -hmm. We're all from the same blood pool, Noah and his wife. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we shouldn't let anybody try to talk us out of it. No. <laughs> Did you find the book? No, not yet. I'll have to do one. Okay. Uh -oh. I want to thank uh, uh -oh. Daniel for uh, I know that sharing this picture with us tonight. Uh, this is a this what they call a BAS boss relief. I'm not sure how you say that boss or base. But of, an, of the Syrian soldiers carrying a statue of Adam Baal. Wow. And some call just say Baal. Yeah. Baal. 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 It depends uh, what your heritage is. But uh, so I'm going to ask Daniel at this time if he would uh, share a little something with us about this one Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Can you go back to the first one? Sure, we can do that. Okay, here's some history on uh, I call them Baal. On Baal, and this is taken from us um, called the Baal Cycle, which was a steel or a stone structure that they discovered in ancient Syria in 1928. And it talks about uh, Baal and who Baal was to them, and them was the Canaanites and the people around that area back in uh, 1300 BC. So we're talking a long time ago. And um, Elijah was around 900 BC. Um, so this ba Baal, quote unquote, existed as a worship figure by the Canaanites 400 years before he came along. And he, the tradition was that you see from that uh, drawing that he was uh, had the headdress of a, ba a bull, mm -hmm. and he those in his hands those are thunderbolts like lightning and thunder, and he was a god of fertility, god of hurricanes, um, and god of uh, the weather. And it says um, he was depicted as a bull animal. Elijah had the prophet slaughter a bull, their god Baal. The sacrificial animal was also required by Jewish law for a sin offering. And, depended, and depending on the status of the sinner, the offering for a high priest or the entire community was a bull. So you're setting up this thing where Elijah is saying to the prophets of Baal, slaughter a bull and put it on the altar. For them, that was their God. They had to slaughter their God. For the Israelites, they were making an offering um, yeah, uh, offering to God. But when you look in the Old Testament, what the bull was required for us uh, offering was for uh, the sin of the entire nation. It was a pretty high price to pay or for a very wealthy person. But um, So here's Elijah on behalf of Israel who has had some of their people turn to Baal. And he set the stage that you're going to kill your own God. We're going to worship ours for your sin that you brought to our people. All right, the second thing, after a day of dancing, incantations, and self-mutilation, Baal failed at his primary function, which is thunderbolts and lightning. In other words, they danced around, they mutilated him, they cut themselves, they did all this from morning until Elijah took over with his part, and Baal was nowhere. So, so much for being God. The Baal cycle, um, also known as the Epic of Baal, is a collection of stories about the god Baal from the uh, Ugaritic text. Baal thwarts off all challengers and rules over other gods as the most powerful of all. So in the story of Baal found on this text, uh, it tells the story about how other gods tried to take over his position and he thwarted them all and he became the god of gods, so to speak. Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God 
and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned upon the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So you kind of get this, uh, this uh, at the story. It's more than just a visual of that we hear from childhood onward of the two altars and everything. God is establishing himself as sovereign over all. That these make-believe gods from your foreign enemies and that you've allowed into Israel and all that amount to nothing. And I will use their own persona, so to speak, the God of hurricanes, rain, and everything. So he took their God, which was a bull, he poured um, and had them slaughter their own God. And then he took them and said, okay, now you take your God's strengths, which are water, and douse my altar many, many times, ruin everything with water, and then go wham, and my God hit it. And guess what? You guys are going bye-bye. We've actually, Mary and I, when we went to the Holy Lands, we actually went there to Mount Nebo, and you're on top of a mountain, think of it like a Shaver Lake, and you can see all the way down to the valley, and there's a, a creek or a small river that runs through there, and it tells us that when the story was over, they quickly captured the 450 Baal <coughs> prophets of Baal and chopped them up into pieces and threw them in that river. Oh. And so as you're standing there on the mountain, you're imagining these two altars, and then you're looking down there in the valley, and you see this, and you're thinking all the body pieces going by are 400. 50 false prophets. So um, anyway, the story is um, when you read it in context of the God that they were worshiping and representing, God uh, whooped them at their own game mm -hmm. and uh, humiliated their God by uh, beating them at his own quote-unquote strengths and so annihilated their religion and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's kind of the backstory to the whole Did thing. Did the Bible say that God started the fire with a lightning bolt also? No, it says that the fire from heaven, and which fire. could have been a lightning bolt. Yeah. I was wondering if that's because he was a God of lightning, so God yeah. used that it, lightning. Let me show you what lightning really yeah. does. And it, and it could have been, you know, it didn't have to be, but it could have been. But anyway, everything those people saw that day was symbolic of their false god, Baal, who was either deaf, sleeping, on vacation or something because they spent a good nine hours. So they did, they didn't slaughter uh, bulls in, in their in their uh, religion. They were, they were sacred sacred to them. That I couldn't find, mm -hmm. but um, I, I don't know. I was just wondering, like the yeah. Hebrews, uh, the yeah, like, well, that was one of the problems with um, with uh, the Israelites in Egypt. They asked Pharaoh for a day to go out in the wilderness outside of the town and do their sacrifice, which was a bull. Well, one of the gods of Egypt was a bull, and they knew that if the Egyptians caught them doing that, they would be so upset. It was just like going to India. If you wouldn't kick the cow out of your way, you'd oh, yeah. probably be arrested and put in jail. So, um, but I couldn't find that. That's one thing that I was looking for, was it similar to the Egyptians, to where it was an anathema to them. It was just repulsive. To sacrifice a bull, but right. they had to do it anyway. But whether or wh whether it was or not, the fact that uh, their god, it's animal symbolism, spirit animal, we would call it today, was a bull. Mm -hmm. Elijah was setting the stage that your spirit animal, your god, kill it and put it on that thing, and we'll have a showdown. Mm -hmm. And so he just used everything about their false god against them. Yeah. And looked them at it. So and everything slaughtered them all. Everything that they attributed to Baal was his downfall. Yeah. Okay. Sounds about right. Yeah. That God gave him, God gave Baal every opportunity to show what he does. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't get out of the water. Because he's not real. I mean, right. we know that. Yes. Not, you know, but back then it's like, okay, uh, here, I'll give you that, I'll give you that, I'll give you that, and you still can't do anything. So anyway, it's a pretty powerful message behind that story as you begin to research a little bit behind the the 
and, and this isn't just made up by uh, people that want to be clever with the Old Testament. These are, these are actual stone tablets that they discovered in, in the area back in the 1920s that had, uh, from that time uh, era, the um, story of what this God was. And he wasn't just the God of these people, the 450 prophets. He was across uh, the known world at that time in various forms and shadows. But the one that they were wor worshiping that day, they were able to find these stones that specifically addressed Baal from that time and how he got to be numero uno with in the God's world. <laughs> now he's, Syria, right? Yeah, just inside of Syria. Now he's inside numero Syria. zilch. Yeah. yeah. He, yeah. Flaked, he flaked on him and didn't show up to work. Okay, we're going to move on. Okay. Uh, we'll take a closer look at this God that we're talking about. Who's the, the only God? So what does God look like? We'll briefly go over this. The Bible tells us that no one has actually seen God. God is invisible. Man is made in God's own image. Those are three characteristics of God. Uh, my wife, she used to teach Sunday school when she was a little girl, when she was a, a teenager and her daddy was a pastor. And she taught Sunday school, and she called children's church. And one day she taught them about Adam and Eve, and that how once they ate of the forbidden fruit that the Lord drove them out of the garden. And so at the end of the class, she asked her kids, and this is like five and six-year-olds, and asked them to draw a picture, something about the Bible lesson they had that they and this one kid drew a picture of what we would call a limousine. <laughs> and there's an old gray-haired white guy, white-haired guy sitting in the front seat, and two people in the back that didn't seem to have any clothes on. And so Don asked, well, what's that picture? What is that? Oh, that's God driving Adam and Eve out of the garden. <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> Cadillac or was it a Mercedes? It was no, it wasn't a Ford. I think that way. <laughs> so then we're all familiar, probably, with the story of the three blind men that were put in a room with an elephant, and they're asked to describe it, the elephant. And so they grab hold on three different parts of the elephant. One grabbed the tail and said, well, it's like a rope. Someone else grabbed hold of the trunk and says, no, no, the elephant's like a snake. And the third one says, you're both wrong. The elephant's like a tree. <laughs> so it depends on our vantage point and what our experience is. Sometimes it's how we envision God being. And there's some uh, kids that you tell them, you know, that God's your heavenly father and he loves you. Well, the father they had abandoned them. The father they had beat them, beat their mom. And so they had no real uh, pleasant vision of what the father is. So we have to tell them, well, this God, this father is different. And that he'll stick by it in the thick and thin. Uh, can I ask a question of the class? Because um, this son, um, in the last few months, I, I keep a prayer journal and all this kind of stuff, and I felt like God was uh, instructing me along the line of ask anything in my name, ask anything in my name, and it's like you know just test me and see, ask anything Amen. in my name. And so I would start out, you know, Father this, Father that, and then I got the impression: Did you ever address your own Father as Father? Where did you address Him? And it's like in my entire life. Our family never called him father, we called him dad. Mm -hmm. So I was felt, or I was led to believe, or, you know, just like Jesus called him Abba, daddy. So start praying, instead of saying father, which you've never, it, it, that word has never come out of your um, mouth in a familial way, family related, start your prayers with dad. 
Boy, you talk about tough, especially in public, to start saying, Dad, you know, thank you for loving us and all that. So just as a show of hands, how many referred to their dad as father? How many referred to him as dad? <laughs> how many referred to him by the first name? <laughs> oh, it's called so, Pop. Yeah, Pop. So, so just think about that, because Jesus, not only did Jesus teach us, you know, he, in, in the Lord's Prayer, he says Father, but he referred to Abba, and then the Apostle Paul, later on in one of his letters, he has a prayer on behalf of one of the churches that he's writing to, I'd have to look it up on my phone, but um, that he, he, his prayer for that church is that you too will be able to have a relationship with God such that you will refer to him as Abba Father which is daddy father. Mm -hmm. And I thought, boy, talk about talk about the relationship. If you can get to where you feel comfortable addressing him as you did your earthly father, whether it's dad, daddy, pops, whatever, with you know, not any disrespect because you when you were using that name you were respecting your own uh, father and so forth. Well I know my kids uh, only called me dad. Unless they wanted something. Yeah. Then it would, Daddy? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. you're Nebraska. What is it? It's on your little mind. What do you want? But I find that we need to refer to him in an affectionate way. And also something the Lord showed me in my own prayer that uh, I like to hear my kids say please. Yeah. And so lately, the last couple of years, I've included the word please yeah. in well, my prayer. Not to beg. But well, I'll, I'll give you a twist on that too. Uh, first of all, Jesus said, um, "Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name." Blah, 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 blah. Give us this day. He didn't use the word please, and yet we teach the word please. But I didn't know this growing up. I didn't know this until probably six, seven years ago. I'm half Swedish, and I, for two years before we went and visited the family, I studied Swedish, and I used to be able to speak a little bit. Um, Anyway, there's no word in Swedish for please. There's a word for thank you, which is taksamika. Thank you very much. It's like muchas gracias. Yeah, but not please. And yet, when I, when I found that out, everything in my family's history made perfect sense. We did not use the word please because that led that custom, even though it became English instead of Swedish, my grandparents were the last to speak Swedish. My father didn't. He still spoke in that um, um, tech context where the word please didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so I always say thank you, but I don't always say please, but it's not because of um, I'm not asking properly in, in American English. It's because the English that was given to me came from Swedish customs, and there was no Swedish word for please. And I, I never knew why that was. We just never said please, but we always said thank you. And then bong, the light went on, and I went, okay, I get it now. It makes sense why me, why I uh, don't always say please. I'll just say, you know, hand me the whatever. And then when you hand it to me, I'll say thank you. And if I say hand me the whatever, people say, well, what's the magic word? And it's like, oh yeah, it's please in America, but I, yeah. I come from a Swedish country. So we're talking about, <laughs> about a cultural problem. Well, a cultural issue. Issue. If you don't have the word please, you don't know to ask for please and so forth. So anyway, don't. Well, I'm saying that to say, don't assume because they don't say please doesn't mean that they're not, they don't have manners. It may be that whatever language they come from it's not a part of their vocabulary yeah. and so forth, so it doesn't translate. It doesn't mean they're not grateful, but anyway. It's a good thing that sometimes the Lord understands our hearts. Exactly. Yeah. He gave us our language after all, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Now, so we talk about God is revealed. God is not discovered by us. And I know lots of times people say, have you found Jesus? And I heard someone say, well, I didn't know he was lost. <laughs> but uh, we have not discovered God. He's revealed himself to us. 
That's like on that mass singer on TV that someone takes the mask off and reveals who they really are. And God has revealed himself. And the mask would be all those things in our traditions and so forth, or how we've been brought up, that how we perceive God. But th th that mask, he's, we need to take that off of God. And we need to see him as he is. So he reveals himself through his creation. Uh, for the in invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The things that are made, wait a minute. Made by who? Pardon? It's made by God. By God, yeah. By God. Yeah. He says there's nothing, not anything that was made that was not made. So he made all things. So those things, his own creation, we behold his beauty and uh, see him as it really is. So then God is revealed through his word. Would someone at this table read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21? Read it. Yes, hear somehow. Well, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is, in, in, is of any private interpretation. The prophet's own understanding for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy, holy Ghost. And notice that it says the King James Version, but those words that are in brackets are words that I stuck in there. That's what the brackets indicate that something is in there that's not really part of the quotation. And you'll find that in a lot of your writings. When they, uh, I like that, the Amplified Bible is where I learned that. Yes, the Amplified Bible does that. Who said that? I did. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you might remember that these prophets were so, were not, not so much predictors of life of the future as they were spokesmen of God. And uh, we often look at the pastor as a prophet, but for him to be a true prophet, he has to proclaim the word of God. That's what a prophet does. He proclaims those things that are coming from God. And it's a good thing we live under grace because if you, in the Old Testament times, if you declared yourself a prophet and you were wrong, it was a ob obligatory of the Israelites to take you out and stone you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're not making a mistake. Yeah. Let me think yeah. about there's, this. There's no autocorrect or white out there. Right. <laughs> there was, uh, so, <laughs> in the Old Testament, God spoke right to the different prophets. And you can hear, and God said, and he goes on and tells what God said. But in the New Testament, they, these New Testament prophets like Paul and Luke and those, they wrote down the words the Spirit inspired in their hearts. So, uh, God is revealed. Do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted, oh, sorry. To, I just wanted to add that uh, uh, like unbelievers would, would ask, well, how do you know the prophet's real? Well, the easy one is is whatever other whatever they're saying is it coming true? Yeah. You know, the, you know, time will tell you. Time will tell you, and anything like uh, as written in the Old Testament, obviously the New Testament, it shows it being revealed in the New Testament, and then. Same thing with like Revelations, uh, that's being shown nowadays. Like, so far, anything on the Bible has been disproven wrong. Mm -hmm. So, that's how you know the, pro uh, the prophet is a real prophet. That's right. how you determine who's a real prophet and who's a false prophet. I know that, that when my son was born, no, I won't relate that story. The, um, the relations the guys, why, why do you think? If, you, if you ever talk to Mormons, Joseph Smith was on record that on the moon there are uh, people, beings like us on earth, that go about doing their daily business like we do. 
that was all rubbed out on July 20th, 1969. On that date was, this is one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And nobody was playing volleyball on the moon that day. <laughs> Joseph Smith is a prophet said da 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 so he was a false prophet obviously oh, but yeah but too, time will tell yeah exactly know? what you're saying mm -hmm. so. well, uh, i was going to ask you you've been to the holy land a lot of times are there a lot of rocks laying around because every place you read in the bible the woman that was brought before them that had been an adultery they were ready to stone her yeah uh the, like you said right now if somebody made a bad a mistake i got there they would get stoned so are there rocks uh, everywhere uh, well in it, yes and no Unfortunately, when the Romans uh, raised the temple, you know, scraped it off the thing, they did a good job. And then later on, when the, um, when the um, Muslims came in, uh, and they had to, uh, uh, Solomon the Great, uh, he's the one that uh, um, kicked the um, uh, Crusaders out. Mm -hmm and he rebuilt the surface of the temple. So what you see today is not really what was there. In fact, some of it's so much dirt has landed on it that trees have grown in the dirt and you have stands of trees on top of the Temple Mount that back in uh, the days of Christ, it was swept and kept clean and so forth. Because I've, I've said that remark many times, if I ever go to the Holy Land and get to go up top, I'm going to look in the rock and see because it said when Jesus, the woman was being uh, wanted to be stoned for adultery, right. that he knelt down and he wrote on the, with his finger. Yeah, right. It doesn't say he wrote in the dust. Yeah. And I personally think that he actually wrote in the stone on the Temple Mount, just like God wrote the Ten Commandments in stone. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what freaked the old Pharisees out. They were the first ones standing there to realize this guy's writing with his finger in the stone. Uh, that's kind of like God. And it was the younger ones that were slow. And the younger ones were the last to put their rocks down and walk away as the old goats started to leave. And I was going to look for that. Well, then I started watching videos of people that can go out of the temple. As a tourist, we don't get to go because we're always with a, either a Jewish um, yeah. Uh, tour guide yeah. and um, uh, so we they can't go on the Temple Mount at least when we went they couldn't go because the uh, um, Palestinians controlled the Temple Mount mm -hmm. anyway long story short um, when I started looking at the videos of people that did go up there and so forth it is so it different the surface that you see there is not the same one necessarily with Christ and then some of it definitely isn't because they got trees growing on it and stuff it's kind of like the when they went to Mexico and they discovered the pyramids, you know, there's so much dirt that fell out of it, and the trees were growing up, and they could move all that stuff out of the way to get down to the pyramid. So, yeah. so it'd be kind of tough to. Yeah. I'm not saying it's not there, but it would be tough to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I would imagine. Okay, we need to move a little faster here. Okay. Sorry. So it would be two weeks, but. <laughs> <laughs> so we learned that God reveals Himself to us through His Son. Who is Jesus, right? Yeah. And uh, John 1 18 says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared or explained him. Christ is our revelation of the Father. Now, the truth of the matter is, we as believers should be a revelation of the Son. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, I don't, when I took ceramics in, in primary school, we'd pour this liquid clay into a mold, and then it would go to the torture chamber called the uh, oven, and it would get fired. We come back, and when you move the mold, you saw what the inside was supposed to look like. Christ is our mold. And if he's in us, they should be able to see Christ in us, the whole glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's, that's, God became a man. Jesus coming to the earth, Christ coming to the earth was more than a general revelation. It was God's personal revelation of himself. Get okay. Amen. 
battery shot as well. Are you plugged in? Yeah, it's plugged in. Are you plugged in on the floor and the wall? Oh yes, there's a picture right there. I wouldn't have that picture there. Oh, what does that say? Your battery is running low. So I guess, oh. are you plugged in? No, I'm not. <laughs> well, you know, when I was over the bridge, I was teaching just pull your... on the Holy Spirit <laughs> and in the ambassador's class. And uh, one of the things that I was trying to teach them, and I explained to them that uh, there was a time when I was uh, helping some folks in the chapel to uh, uh, get their amplification equipment working. And they told me, they said, well, you know, oh, that's got a cover on it. Anyhow, <laughs> that's locked up. They got kids in here, I guess, and that's why. It's got a child shop on the cover. We have to remember to put that back in. Oh, so cute. I'll go that way. Okay. There you go. Hey. Yay. <laughs> so God reveals himself to us through his son. And he reveals his, his son to others through us. Still not working. It's gone. You're charging. Yes. Are you trying to use your mouse or are you trying to use your mouse? No, there's a button like you showed me. Okay. Go to the right. I was trying to use the mouse. Right. Right. That's the mouse. So, then God revealed himself to us through his son Jesus. And John 14, 9 says, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So, uh, back to the mold, when that piece of ceramic comes out of the fire, it's not quite ready. Sometimes it's got to be fired twice. When the first time it's fired, it's called bisque, and it's very fragile. The second time they fire it, it gets very hard. The third time they fire is when they put glaze on it, and that's to melt the glaze. And so uh, we go through different things, different fires in our lives, and the whole idea is to make us more like Jesus. As the surrounding, the clay was to be made more like whatever it was the symbol of, what it was in the mold. God is real. Jesus came to us to give us understanding. John 5 20. Someone like to read that for us? And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is true God and eternal life. Amen. Amen. So, Christ is coming to give us understanding. And we really see the Father as He really is and uh, what He requires of us. Jesus chose to reveal the Father. He says, All things, Matthew 11 27, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Let's face it, on a, on a regular basis, God reveals more and more about the Lord to, to us. And I don't know about you, I read a verse of Scripture, and make notes in the margin and so forth, and sometime later I come back and I said, well, i got to add another note to that because the Lord is speaking something else to me through it. Okay. So God reveals himself in many, many ways. 
for the invisible things, Romans 1 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. So, uh, man has a, a natural desire, a natural desire to know a God, if there is one. So that's why they made all these other gods, because they didn't know the real one true God. Now, a friend of mine, Tony Sutherland, uh, he was a missionary to the Philippine Islands during the Second World War. And uh, the natives would hide him in their villages and to protect him from the Japanese. And he had a son, Ellis. Uh, he pronounced it Alice, Scottish bro. And when he started talking about his son Alice, I was wondering who would name their son Alice. But, uh, and I had a sister Alice. Uh, anyhow, uh, they would pray at night uh, before they went to bed. They would pray as a family before they went to bed. And Ellis would always pray one more thing to <coughs> add to the rest of the family's prayer. So his dad was kind of, uh, uh, his dad named name Sandy Sutherland. Sandy was really curious, what is this kid asking the Lord? And so one evening he said, son, uh, what are you asking the Lord? What are, you, what are you praying about? And he very boldly says, daddy, I'm praying that God would send us a submarine mm. so we could get out of here. Several days later, they're down walking by the beach. And then all of a sudden, this little rubber boat comes ashore. And it's some American sailors off a submarine. And their radio went out. Now, this is in the before transistors. These were two radios. And this, this Sandy, and they come together somehow or other. So Sandy said, well, why, why did you come ashore? He said, well, our communication equipment is going out, and we're kind of hoping we would find a tube to fix it. And so he said, well, I got a little radio, battery opera radio, well, what kind of tube do you need? And Sandy was a tinkerer, he knew what was in that radio. When they got a sailor told him what he said, well, I got one of those. He tore the back off, pulled it out. Sandy and his wife and son got in that rubber boat, went back to the submarine. But before they got there, the second submarine come up, checking on the first submarine. But God not only answered his prayer, but he answered it double. Asked largely that you join me before. Amen? <laughs> yeah. God is revealed. God will reveal himself in his fullness. For now, this is, I think most of you know this one. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So he's going to reveal himself in his fullness. And uh, we'll stop right here. But we're going to know God in his fullness, and we're going to know all about him. You know, one of these days, you know, like that song says, we'll understand it better when? Amen. By and by. When this day is done. You know, so but we need to pray. We need to pray that God would help us to see him as he really is. I know Sandy Sutherland when he accepted the Lord in the old bar, his daughter and granddaughter were praying for him. And his wife and his daughter were praying for him. And he was in the old bar. And he knelt there in the sawdust floor. And just nobody there to prompt him. And just gave his heart to the Lord and asked Christ to come into his heart and his life. But he saw himself. He said, suddenly I saw myself through God's eyes. And I don't know, it might be kind of scary. 
to see yourself through God's eyes. But we need, we need that. We need to see. I, I know I, I talk to people and say, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. There's nothing wrong. No, no, I'm all right. But if they really knew themselves like God does, they might toot a different horn. So let's go to prayer. We're going to ask uh, Frank. Uh, we've already prayed for you tonight. When you're here. But then we prayed for the, the sick. But would you pray for us as a class? And then uh, dismiss us in prayer at the same time. Yes. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for gathering us here today to learn about your word. Uh, please uh, continue teaching us how to uh, use your word and, 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 and show them show the, your word to others and for others uh, to bring peace to others as well. Uh, thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us. Yes. Uh, thank you for for our brother Jim and uh, for taking the lead and teaching us uh, more of your word. And uh, and please take her, all of us here uh, going home. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray.